was introduced to Carl Jennings. Carl's an artist and also is fascinated with science. And he posed this really interesting question. He said to me, when you look at a rainbow, what do you see? I went, you know, colors. We all know Newton's color theory, that color is dependent on frequency. As the frequency increases, we go from the red end of the spectrum up to the blue or indigo and violet end of the spectrum. But Carl said, okay, so a rainbow, spectrum of colors, or from a prism, what do you see? Hmm. I said, well, yeah, you see bands of colors, you know, classic kiddies rainbow drawing or what you actually see with your eye. And he said, exactly, bands of colors. Why isn't it a continual grad from red to blue? This fascinated me, so I decided to go and talk to Carl, and I made a short film with Carl explaining his theory. That was back in 2014. Since then, Carl has collaborated with a color scientist, Lou Adams, and they've written and published a paper on banding and on color perception. It's gone down extremely well and has led to a new understanding of color theory. My name is Carl Jennings. I'm an associate professor of art at Kapi'olani Community College, a part of the University of Hawaii system. I teach studio art and I teach creative thinking. Most of the artists I know have a, have a keen interest in, in science or being informed about the world. And I think they're both ways of investigating the world. Uh, both scientists with their research and, and empirical sort of studies and investigations. It's very similar to what an artist does. Uh, it's just we're doing it slightly differently. I've always, always been in, interested in color. My Part of my master's thesis was on Rudolf Arnheim's theories of color. And I read John Gage's Color and Culture 15 years ago, and I think I checked it out at the library 12,000 times. So I've had this fascination with the history of color, obviously the history of pigments and how they're made and where they come from, and, and the alchemy or the science behind uh, early painters making their colors. Uh, interested in the psychology to a degree. Um, chromophobia, the fear of color. So the science of color was just another aspect of that. I wanted to understand it and it seemed very counterintuitive that the grass, for example, is every color but green according to science and a banana is every color but yellow. I always thought that was kind of interesting. Um, at the same time I wanted to know more about that. And so the prism was, was a way into that. This whole project originated out of a color theory class. I decided uh, this time, and this was about 10 years ago, that I would actually show the students uh, Newton's famous uh, projected prism uh, using a prism in a dark chamber. So we all went into the, into the photography room, and I brought in a projector, and we turned the lights out, and I grabbed a prism uh, like this uh, that I recently purchased in Canada, put the projector in front of it, put the light through the prism and looked at the wall and I'm sitting here about to amaze these students with this incredible array of colors and all we got was a white wall with a little bit of red and yellow on one side and a little bit of blue and cyan on the other. And no matter what I did, uh, moving the prism around or the projector or the distance, uh, nothing would work. And I, I felt really bad for the students, so I apologized. I said, obviously I got a cheap prism, I just bought it in Canada from a toy store. Believe me, it works. Um, sorry I couldn't demonstrate it today. So that was that. I put it away. Uh, not terribly interested in prismatic colors, mostly colors in terms of painting. And about five, six years later, I was reading a book by Goethe, and he talks about 
uh, the prism and where Newton had made what he called a mistake and that what you should see if you are close to the wall with the prism is white pure white light with edge colors or boundary colors and I read that and I immediately went that's what we saw that was it what I had projected was this and here's somebody whose color theory is fairly well known whose color ideas are fairly well developed uh, saying this is what you should get and so that really got me interested in, in jumping into this whole thing and and wondering about what is this thing called color and, and why is some of the information misleading and the textbooks tend to be a little bit wrong so I became fascinated with looking through prisms walking around the world like this uh, when you do that you find colored edges and I knew that they had a pattern and I thought I wonder what that pattern is why is it always here why is the red always there and next to the yellow and why is the blue and the cyan always over there and if I turn the prism they all switch so I knew there was a, an order a pattern behind it uh, so I started reading all I can on it and none of it seemed to explain what I was looking at I find light uh, infinitely fascinating. Uh, it's part of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum, which is this long spectrum of, of frequencies of vibration of this electric magnetic energy. Really difficult to, to conceptualize and get around our heads, but we're right now immersed in a soup of this energy, buzzing in all different directions, moving at astronomical speeds uh, from radio waves and microwaves and x-rays. And on that entire spectrum of energy, there's a very small area um, which we identify as visible light. We can see it. And what that means is that when that part of the spectrum, a certain frequency, a certain wavelength, or vibration when it hits our eye our eye is designed to pick that up uh, as an image with color and we translate it in into color so depending on the wavelength or the frequency how fast these waves move and how long they are it'll either be color or it'll be an x-ray or it could be a gamma ray or it could be a radio wave so all of these things are just different manifestations of the same basic uh, electromagnetic energy According to the accepted uh, color science of, of today, light is a continuum. It, it changes very, very gradually, and the colors that we see are also sort of on a continuum, uh, infinitely divisible. And so you would go from reds into slowly moving into oranges, into uh, yellowy greens to greens and uh, pale blue greens, and, and you would gradually, gradually change, because that was the nature of light. Uh, as understood. However, when looking through uh, prisms at various objects, that wasn't the case. What you would find are discrete bands and separations. And then within those bands, the colors themselves did not change. There was no gradation. There was no continuum within it. I thought this was fascinating. Um, nothing in the literature mentions anything like this. Science describes color as a unique frequency, all mixing into each other in a smooth way. But Carl was fascinated by the discrete bands we all see in a spectrum. You look at the bottom image, what you see are very discrete separations, bands between the colors, and what also appears like a very limited number of colors. We have the red, we have the yellow, the green, the cyan, and the blue. What do you see? Do you see a gradual change that's almost pale and white in the middle? Or do you see distinct shapes of color? Why was that there? I, I wanted to know, I was curious. Is it my eyes that are making those bands? Is it the camera? Is it the prism? Uh, so the explanation is very puzzling as, as to why. Um, why do we see banding? In the realm of psychology, we have something called categorical perception. And what that is, is, is a mechanism whereby our brain will take things that are very similar and group them together. 
So it takes things that might have a gradual change, but because it's next to something else that has, there's a big change, it kind of groups them all together as a category. What Carl has observed has always been there, maybe dismissed by science as unimportant, but it just might be a brand new way of understanding color. But what Carl did next moved the idea to a whole new level. So I, I had these ideas and I put them together in a paper and I wanted to, you know, I'd scoured the literature and I was pretty confident nothing like this had ever been spoken of, in, in this way at least. I decided to sort of just go in at the deep end. And it turns out that the Inner Society Color Council of the United States uh, we're having an annual conference at the University of North Carolina and I submitted my abstract and they accepted it. I was somewhat surprised but happy. Now all their presentations were calculus and linear algebra and all these formulas and, and I thought to myself, you know, what the hell am I doing here? You know, they're going to eat me alive. And, and so I almost walked out. I was getting sweat rings under my arms and you know, I thought this is a big mistake, Carl. You've, you've, you've You've not thought this through properly. And towards the end of the afternoon, a Lifetime Award was being given to a color scientist by the name of Rolf Kuhaney. And his presentation was uh, a little bit more historical and about color wheels and Goethe and Newton. And it was like a perfect segue into what I was doing. So it kind of gave me the confidence to then walk up and present a presentation which had no math, no science. It was all just pretty pictures and presenting a, a concept which is, is challenges you know the sort of the standard theories of the basics of color um, and it went incredibly well uh, there was no applause or anything like that in fact when there was a question session nobody asked a single question and I thought well what does this mean uh, am I just is it am I gonna get clobbered later Anyway, I met some of the scientists after and got incredibly uh, positive feedback about it. it was, they were saying, you know, this is something that they learned in, in college but never really questioned, never really thought about. Uh, one in particular, Mike Brill, who's uh, pretty well known in, in the world of color, um, said it was one of the most interesting presentations he's seen in the, in the last few years. So that, that gave me enormous kind of relief and, and confidence that, you know, I, I'm an artist, I'm coming from the world of painting and art history and, and the idea that something I can come, I can see can be taken somewhat seriously in a very, very uh, rigorous scientific world was, was very surprising and, and very, very, very comforting. Uh, and at the end of that conference, uh, Lou Adams, a color scientist, came up to me and said, you know, would you like to... Uh, enter into a sort of correspondence about your ideas I was kind of interested and that's turned out to be a three-year sort of correspondence where we're working on papers together and so we've had this wonderful uh, back and forth email three-year correspondence uh, about this we're getting ready to put some ideas together to publish but I I, th I think it was it's an interesting example of how you know coming from the art world I didn't have the same uh, I guess what I'd call all, all domains have baggage, you know, their ways of looking at things. Because I had a certain naivete, I could, I could look at something so basic as Newton's rainbow and, and ask questions about it. 99% um, of the time those questions might be rather silly because, you know, I'm, I'm not educated or schooled as a scientist and, and people crossing disciplines is very, very tricky. Um, but it really is an interdisciplinary sort of uh, work that we've been able to create because Lou has added so much and uh, found new material, new ideas within it. He's quantified, he's come up with alternative models that describe other things that are statistical, for example. Uh, so we've, we've really been able to sort of take the ways that we, we look at things uh, and, and med meld them together and come up with something which we think, we hope, is something really quite new. And I quite like that idea of, of modeling the world and then changing and developing the models uh, as, as things change and develop.